Uh, many times, I know we have a smaller crowd here tonight, but many times uh, people have differing points of view, and um, we all have to be respectful of everyone's points of view, and I have a zero tolerance policy for any uh, disrespectfulness or uh, treatment of people. So just to let you know that. Um, I was just gonna say, hey guys, quick, can you guys hear me without the microphone? Yeah. Is that a yes stream? Can't hear you without the mic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to go over a couple things that the legislature has um, done in the past session. So we just completed our first session, which was from January to uh, May, May 31st. Um, one of the things that I've always been a big proponent of is that during difficult times when people are suffering in the state and you have high unemployment numbers, high unemployment numbers uh, that legislators and elected officials need to lead by example. So I uh, sponsored legislation that would force legislators to take um, furlough days, unpaid um, days on the job. And so that um, amounted into a substantial pay cut for them. And I think that as elected officials, it's important to understand what is going on and be able to empathize with the people of the district. So that, um, that passed both chambers and that went uh, to the governor's desk where he signed that. Um, let's see, the other problem too that we've had, and I know that pensions are a very, very big, big issue, and um, we, um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, mistrust with the pension systems and a lot of uh, corruption that has happened with very few missions. I'm trying to think of how I can avoid cutting in and out. Gene, can you hear me? If I stand here? Okay. All right. There you go. So we all know that we've had problems in the state of Illinois with various commissions um, getting appointed, and then they would also have pension benefits and very lucrative salaries for, uh, for commissions that maybe meant once a month. So I also sponsored legislation that would eliminate um, pension benefits for these individuals that are appointed to these commissions and um, that maybe only serve 12 days a year. And that was something that was really putting a drain on our pension system and causing problems for those people who had legitimately paid into the pension system. Um, the other thing, too, is that uh, one of the things that I realized when I was down there was that there are uh, a number of committees. And I was, I was a, little, a little taken aback by um, how many committees there were in Springfield. And I couldn't quite figure it out until I realized that committee chairmen actually get an additional stipend for being a committee chairman. So I introduced legislation to eliminate the, uh, the chairman uh, stipend for, um, for the chairman of the committees because I believe that it's an honor to serve and that just by being asked to be a, a chairperson of a committee, that that, is, um, that it should be honor enough to be able to, to do that. Um, the other thing too that um, we, you know, I hear an awful lot about, and I know this is on everyone's mind, is the property tax issue. And this is something that is always on people's minds, especially in Lake County, where we have the 15th highest property tax county in the nation, according to Forbes magazine. So when you just look at your tax bills and you can see how much they go up each year, we need to, I mean, we have to recognize the fact that we do need uh, property tax reform. And one of the things that I was able to work through is to get an increase in um, the senior exemptions uh, for property taxes. So that will go up to $5,000 for our seniors. And we're still working on additional exemptions for uh, homeowners as well. Um, let's see here. One of the other areas of, of economic growth that we need to we need to look at is um, you, there's so much more to Illinois than just outside the Chicago land area. Illinois is is very agrarian, and there's a huge opportunity there for economic growth and development within agribusiness. And when we look at our population size here in counties versus the rest of the state is that we need to start focusing on buying and eating locally. Um, it was projected that if everyone spent $10 a week uh, just on purchasing food that was grown locally, that it would generate an additional about $2 billion in economic development um, for, for the state. Now, albeit that small, but something very simple as in investing $10 back into uh, to the local economy each week can create a huge economic stimulus. So that's something too that um, has passed and that goes into effect now um, for uh, the new, for next year, the governor just signed that. Um, the other major issue, and um, 
that is being addressed right now at the state level is obviously the pension system. Uh, we all know that the pension system is uh, destabilized. Uh, it's, this has happened through decades of underfunding, decades of borrowing against the pension systems, and so now with the economic implosion of you know, around 2007, 2008, that really exacerbated the, um, our pension crisis. So what we started to do is started to look at various pension proposals in order to stabilize the state's finances. Uh, to give you an idea of what the pension exposure is like, uh, this year alone, Illinois had a billion dollars more in pension increases um, than it did the year before. So it cost the state a billion dollars more this year for pensions. Um, that it was, and we had roughly about, a, we were projecting about a $1.3 billion increase in revenue. So out of that $1.3 billion, a billion of that just had to go to pensions. Now next year, it's projected that more, that it's gonna be about one and a half billion that's gonna to have to go to pensions. So this is, this is strangling out the budget, and it's forcing cuts in areas like education, public safety, and on top of that, it's forcing the state into a position where it cannot fund their pension liabilities, and will be forced into a position, if, if the pension system is not reformed, to start borrowing money again. And we all know that that's not the right path to get out of our financial crisis. So there's a number of competing pension bills right now. There were two that came up um, during the, uh, the legislative session. Um, neither one of them passed. And now, right now, the legislature has what they call a conference committee. And that conference committee is made up of representatives and senators. And they're looking at new pension ideas. They're taking testimony right now um, from various, uh, uh, various interested parties, other legislators who have proposed pension uh, reform legislation to try and put together a bill that um, is palatable to enough people, to enough legislators, in order to get it through the General Assembly. And time is definitely against us on this, and this is something that, that I'm strongly in favor of, is the need to reform our pension system for, uh, for two key reasons. Number one, we need to stabilize the state's finances, but number two, everyone who is participating in the pension system right now, who paid into the system, they are living in a life of uncertainty right now because they don't know what the outcome is going to be. And so make, trying to make life decisions when you are anticipating retiring in a few years if, and, and you're relying on a pension, is that's really unfair to do to people to put their lives in upheaval and uncertainty. So resolving the pension crisis um, is, is helpful in, in those two ways. First of all, we've got to, we've got to um, salvage the state's finances. But then two, we also have to provide security and long-term security for the people who played by the rules and paid into the system. So that is one of the main things that, um, that's one of the major focuses that's going on right now in terms of the state's finances. Uh, this year, the state actually took in more than it projected. So in addition to the additional $1.2 billion in revenue increases, there was an approximately an additional $2 billion in unexpected revenue increases. So it went up roughly about $3.2 billion. $2 billion of that money was used to pay down old bills. So we had about $9 billion in unpaid bills. That's essentially bills that are owed to social service providers, uh, you know, municipalities, uh, a variety of different, a variety of different people who provide services to the state. So we had $9 billion in unpaid bills, and we used $2 billion of it to bring down to $7 billion. Now, that really is a drop in the bucket, but it's heading in the right direction. So what we need to do is even in addition to solving our financial problems, then we still have to pay off the $7 billion in unpaid bills. And this is, this is money that you know, is, is owed to our you know, local agencies. These are, these are agencies that provide services to, to our residents and to the people of Illinois. So it's inherently unfair to have to, for them to suffer the state's inability to manage its finances. But the state cannot manage its finances until the pension system is resolved. So when I talk with a lot of people and they bring up different issues, you know, we have to view everything in the, through the prism of pensions because pensions are eating up so much of, of our budget and it's just the costs are getting to a point where they're just exponential. And um, so until something is done, it, it's gonna be very hard to restore funding to education, um, to, uh, to, to do other things, to do capital improvement projects. One of the things that is worth noting is that in the absence of any sort of pension reform, our bond rating keeps going down. And Illinois' bond rating was just decreased yet again. Um, this amounts to essentially an additional $130 million 
in interest payments that the state's going to have to make on their bonds because the finances are so poor. Now, this, now the bond rate, we can start, once we do pension, once we do pension reform, we'll start to see an immediate relief because the bond markets will immediately respond to that. And then that will make renegotiating the rates on our current bonds that much easier because we send a message to the bond market saying, Illinois is, is doing what it needs to do to get back on sound uh, financial footing. So, so that's one of the major things that um, needs to get resolved. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that the conference committee can come up with a solution and a proposal that we can um, go back to Springfield in August and discuss and debate and uh, hopefully have that resolved. I'm not holding my breath, but that's certainly something that you know I would like to see happen. And I, I think a lot of people in Illinois, and especially residents of the district, would like to see happen. Um, so that's that's one of the major issues that um, that was addressed during this last session and still being addressed. Um, another major issue, which you probably have read a lot about in the newspapers and seen on TV, is the concealed carry issue. Uh, just to give you a little background on that, the courts ruled that Illinois' laws on concealed carry were unconstitutional. Um, Illinois prohibited concealed carry, and those gun laws were determined to be unconstitutional. So the court gave the legislature until, it was either June 8th or 9th, I can't remember which date it was, to resolve the problem via legislation. So this took up, and there was a lot of time that was spent on this, because in the absence of passing any concealed carry legislation, it would have gone to what's called open carry, which means that you could have carried a gun anywhere at any time for any reason, and there would have been no regulations in place. So people on both sides of the issue both agreed that going to an open carry situation was not necessarily the best thing. And um, so this is why there was so much time and energy put into this specific issue um, during the past session, was the need to address this before the deadline. Um, so this bill got passed out of, um, out of both chambers on May 31st, the last day. It was, um, there was an amendatory veto put in place by the governor. Uh, a governor has the power to either veto a bill or to make um, changes to it. So, and that's called an amendatory veto. So the governor made amendatory vetoes to the bill. Um, the legislature overrode those vetoes, and so the current bill that was passed at the end of session is now in place. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have in regards to that. Um, I just want to kind of quickly run through some of these uh, some of these bullet points here of some of the major issues that we were discussing. I uh, discussed the budget, paid down the bills. Um, the other major thing that was taken up, and I'm, not, I'm sure some of you have heard of this, is hydraulic fracturing. It's fracking for short. And what that does is Illinois' uh, mining laws basically dated back to the 1940s. And hydraulic fracturing is a system that where you drill down and you use um, an enormous amount of water and other chemicals to break apart bedrock and um, acts as natural gas deposits in areas that they otherwise could not be could be mined. In. <laughs> so we put into place um, the country's most uh, right, uh, the most stringent uh, regulations for fracking. Um, and what that will do is um, it will help uh, the southern part of Illinois uh, develop economically um, in an environmentally sound way. Uh, lots of states you might read about are here, especially on the East Coast, where um, Pennsylvania you hear about, northern New York, where they didn't have proper regulations in place. So these companies came in and basically had a free-for-all, and there was, there was no monitoring them, and that led to a lot of contamination of aquifers and uh, people's water supply. So that was something that Illinois didn't want to repeat. So this was, um, this was a consensus bill that was put together by the environmental community, uh, the business community, and so that is now in effect. And that's something that um, we'll have to wait to see how that works out at the, um, as that starts to get developed in the, in the upcoming years. Um, for those of you who have just arrived or arrived late, um, Comptroller Topinka has fallen ill and she will not be able to join us tonight. Um, but she is sending a, uh, her chief deputy who is running a few minutes late and he should be here shortly. So why don't we do this? Um, while we wait for him, do you, are, does anyone have any questions about things that are going on at the legislative level, or David? So I know you just came through a significant learning curve called civics, probably 10 of 10, um, understanding how laws are enacted. So for the lay person, why is there so much fluff? Why is there so many other lower <coughs> priority bills being paid attention to when we have such a significant financial pension and finance. Why 
why is leadership not saying nothing? No, I mean, I know Silk Carry had to be addressed, but mm -hmm. why, why are they saying nothing gets addressed until we get this financial problem fixed? In terms of, of the pensions or? Yeah, right. I mean, okay. we, this is the only thing we're going to work on as a legislative body in both chambers until it gets fixed. And farm bills and this are just going to have to wait because I think Illinoisans believe the number one problem in the state. You know, you talked about in your campaign. The number one problem is we got to get the financial control of the state. Right. And to answer your questions about the pension, I mean, let's face it, in order to get the financial stability of the state under control, we need to address the pensions. So let's take a look at some of the history of the pensions. You do have, some of my colleagues have been there very long. You know, you're talking decades, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. And they're in a mentality that we are, we're just fine. We don't need to change anything. And, um, and everything's worked out, we've been through bad times before, and that we don't need to, we're not gonna rock the boat by having to pass a tough pension bill. And so you have, you had a large contingent of people in both chambers, both the Senate and the, and the House, saying this, which made um, getting to you know, the 50% the plus one vote in either chamber very difficult. So you had this mentality. Now, one of the things that I was actually very excited about was that when um, uh, Governor Quinn recently vetoed pay to the legislators, I don't know if you've read about this, but he line item vetoed pay to the, legis to the legislators until the pension system is resolved. And I say that's a great idea. You know, it's if, if, legis if that's what legislators need to get their acts in gear, great, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm willing to support that. But the, the long and the short of it is you have a contingent of, of legislators who have been there a while who don't want to have to make a tough vote. And, um, and possibly, um, you know, maybe they're, they're too heavily entrenched with some special interest on either side. What was really frustrating to me was during the pension debate on the House floor, and we spent several months doing this, is you would have certain representatives that would stand up and talk about the need for pension reform, pension reform, pension reform. We've got to do something, we've got to do something. And then when a proposal was presented to them, they voted no. And to me, that's very frustrating as a freshman legislator because that, to me, represents you being part of the problem. And um, let's face it, any pension bill that's passed, no one's going to love it. There's going to be something in, in, the, in the pension bill that's passed that's going to upset somebody. It's not going to be perfect. It can't be perfect. And um, that's the unfortunate reality of the situation. Right? So there's going to be something in that bill that you're not going to like. But you know what? In order to solve our financial problems, they're gonna to have to be voted for. And I think people, I mean, this has been going on for years, so I don't necessarily understand why it's taking people so long to, to develop this mentality, but I think the legislators, some legislators are now coming to the realization, oh, doing nothing is no longer an option. And so when you have that distraction going on with the pensions, not being able to do anything, that's when other legislators who maybe have issues that are important to their specific districts, you know, doing legislation on, you know, in the meantime. Well, the governor could have gone one step further, <clears throat> spending the salary of senior people. You're not responsible for the problem, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I in, right? Well, as a member of the chamber, I've inherited a problem. Incentivized. So, right. Paying a little bit of flux. Right. There's um, but yeah, I mean, we'll we'll see what that what happens. That'll be an, um, it'll be interesting to get the Comptroller's office opinion on this because it's a fascinating constitutional battle going on right now. Can can the governor change the salaries of the legislators in the middle of the term? The argument is, I'm not changing the salaries, I'm just not funding them. And the comptroller has a, has a constitutional obligation. She can't pay bills unless there's a line item. So there's this little push and pull as to figure out exactly where we're at constitutionally. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I want a little clarification. Sure. With the pension, who does that directly affect? Evidently, all the state employees, but is that also teachers? Is that the pensions? Right, so there's there's several pension systems. There's uh, one that affects uh, public employees, um, teachers, okay. university professors, um, legislators, judges. Okay. And um, they're, all have, um, they're all in separate pension systems. So this legislation, um, the legislation that, that was discussed um, in terms of pension reform during the last session, addressed all the pension systems with the exception of the judicial pension system. And the reason that was done was the logic was it would prevent members of the Supreme Court who are ultimately gonna end up deciding the constitutionality of any sort of pension law 
it would prevent the members of the Supreme Court from being able to say, we have a conflict of interest here because we're deciding on something that could financially benefit ourselves. So once, you know, the, the hope is, once they give some indication to the General Assembly on whatever legislation is passed, when, once they rule on that, then we can look at that and say, okay, they've ruled on this, a precedence has been set, now we can do the same for the judicial system and there's precedence. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, I, I didn't know all like, uh, there were so many different mentions, but right. I, I, I wanted to know, make sure the teachers were in that. Yeah, I it's... That's a, that's a big chunk of that. Right, one of the things with the pension system is that over the years, over the decades, they've added what, what's called sweeteners. And these were little gifts that were given um, to people in the system. Um, and one of the biggest uh, sweeteners that was given was the uh, what's called the compounding cola. And that's a 3% each year increase on your pension and that compound. So that's where our biggest financial exposure is, is with that compounding cola. Yes, sir? Uh, I'm Tony Picard from Round Lake Heights. I've been talking to Tony, is it? Yeah. Okay. I've been talking to Bill Brady. I've been talking to Barb Wheeler. Uh, I'm a trustee. I've been looking hard into the pension. I'm a numbers kind of guy. Uh, two questions. Sure. Are they going to vote for a holiday? Because if they do that again, that's going to screw up the pension thing. A vote for a holiday for the state pension system? Pension system, because that will screw it up. That will be a night two. Right. Um, what I'm also looking at is why can't there be an addendum to the Constitution? I've been looking at the Constitution. Tony, would you mind using the microphone? Oh, just I'm, so sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Martin. I'm sorry. No, no, uh, that's right. I have a hearing aid, so I'm trying to adjust my voice. Uh, addendum, to, uh, addendum to the Constitution. Because if I'm reading the Constitution right, the House and the Senate can put up an addendum to the Constitution, even into the pension program, that could stand up with the Supreme Court. I've been doing a lot of research on this, and I've heard nobody say addendum. What scares me the most is this holiday thing. This is what got us in trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chicago did the same thing. Thank goodness Chicago is not involved in certain things because their budget is way different. And their pension program is the TRS. Because um, I'm telling you, I've been looking into this, and I don't understand why an addendum, you can do an addendum to that Constitution. And I can't understand why I ask newspapers, they don't want to bring that up. Sure. There is, uh, let me answer your first question first, the holiday. Uh, there is, I'm not aware that any legislation has been introduced for a pension holiday. And if there is legislation that was introduced for a pension holiday, it's going to get squashed pretty quickly. There's, this was the, um, one of the first years now that the legislature has fully funded the pension system. And um, going back to not funding it is just a path for even more disaster. So I don't support not funding the pension system via holidays. I, it, like I said, it's a recipe for disaster. Now, in terms of Chicago, Chicago's looking has asked the legislature to, um, to give it a holiday. And um, there hasn't been any firm action on that. So, and that's something that I also don't support because, you know, you pay your pensions first and then and then move on, you know, pay your, your fixed costs. I also believe in a tier program for the pension. They get so much money because I can break it down how much a superintendent of school after 10 years they'll right. receive a salary plus. Nobody in this room will receive that. But a tier, $100,000 for even the colleges, even, even the top teachers. But also that E. coli, once you hit that number, you don't get an E. coli. If you're 82,000, you don't get an E. coli. Maybe 750, something that's in a reasonable range to keep the pension program going. So I've been doing a lot of research. Anybody below that, but still they're getting a greater pension than most of us will in our lifetime. So there has to be some, that's why I'm looking at an addendum. That was my second Oh, sure. Yeah, that so, so the way, back during the 1970s Constitutional Convention, uh, for those of you who, who might not know, there was a constitutional amendment put on, there was an amendment put on to the Illinois Constitution. And that said that pensions could not be diminished in any way. Um, so this is becoming an issue in, in the pension debate because you have to structure a bill that is gonna be constitutional. So to, to your point is that in order to overturn that amendment, there has to be another amendment, amendment to overturn it. And that requires a supermajority of the legislature, and then it goes on to the ballot for everyone in the state to vote on. And, I, and don't quote me on this, but I believe that you need 60% of the vote in order for of the popular vote to, to pass that. 
So where, where the problem is, is you can't hit that, you can't hit that super majority number. Yeah. So, yeah, so to answer your question on that. Is there a Supreme Court where they can step in and, or is there uh, enough of them that will allow you to step in? The Supreme Court does not have the power to step in until they actually have a bit of, uh, uh, some piece of, uh, a lawsuit. Right. And right now, there's, there's no reform bill that's been signed into law, so there is no lawsuit. So this is, so the main thing that the legislature needs to do is to get a bill together because it's, it's going to end up in court regardless. And, um, and the courts ultimately, the Supreme Court's ultimately going to decide the outcome of it. And if, if they, and this could take up to two years. So let's say in two years, um, the Supreme Court says this bill is unconstitutional. Well, two years down the road, we're right back to where we started from. So that's why there's so much urgency on this issue, not just to immediately start saving money, but because it's got to go through the whole legal process now. And, um, you know, now inevitably there will be an organization that will file um, a constitutionality lawsuit against it. Good luck. I mean, thank you. Because what I'm saying is you're going to have heroin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, did I see any other hands? Wendy. So um, it's a two-parter. You said um, what that the bill had to be palatable for pensions to pass. What will make it palatable for the legislators? Oh. Could you hear me? Yeah, you, would you mind repeating it for everyone? <laughs> you said earlier that if, in order for the pension bill to pass, it would have to be palatable for legislators. What would make it palatable? And I'm, I'm not I'm not making fun of your question, but my answer would be what day of the week is it? You know, there are there are some yeah, legislators, there are some legislators, especially those who've been there a while, that um, you know the legislature is a fascinating study in psychology, and um, and there are some people there that today they're for pension reform and tomorrow they're not, and there's there's literally no rhyme or reason to it. They can't give you justification. It's just no, I'm not. No, I don't feel like I'm going to vote for that today. But to answer your question is for more reasonable majority of, of the body. It's um, it's something that a, well, obviously is is deemed or perceived to be constitutional. Um, secondly, it's something that actually has an impact, a financial impact on the state's long-term uh, uh, pension exposure. Right now, it's you know projected about 100 billion, depending on who you talk to, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. But let's just say 100 billion. So it's gotta make a dent in that 100 billion dollars. But then it also has to, uh, the, the what is that? Two, two, the third component would be to make sure that it's fully funded, um, not fully funded, funded, and it ranges between 80 to 90 percent, depending on what bill you're looking at, um, in 30 years. So there's that as well. And then it's doing all of this while being fair to the people who are in the system and who paid their share and who did nothing wrong and um, who made their payments each each paycheck, and the state just you know took holidays. And so, so that's the formula you're looking at. Now, as I said earlier, you're never going to have a pension bill that is going to meet every one of those criteria. And, um, and this, is where, this is where it comes to having to take a tough vote. And there are many people who are in that body who are more interested in getting reelected than just doing what needs to be done. And um, so, so there you have the political element in there, but it's getting to a point now where there is there's so much pressure on the system that it's, it, I mean, it's, it's going to implode that something is gonna have to be done. So that's why I have hope that this conference committee is gonna come out with some type of reasonable plan that is gonna get the majority. Now, just to, to give you a quick side note here, the way the Constitution is written is right now, we're in what's called veto session. So you need to have a super majority of both chambers in order for a bill to instantly go into law. If you don't have a super majority and the governor signs it, then it won't go into law until summer of next year, about a year from now. So if a pension bill is passed, let's say in August, um, and I'm just pulling that out of the air, I'm not saying there's gonna be a vote in August, but let's say there is one, and um, that would require a, if it only got a simple majority, and let's say the governor were to sign it, that would not go into effect for about a year from now because constitutionally it cannot. Um, the only way would be if the legislature re-voted on it come January 1. So January 1 is when the clock gets reset. You can go back to passing instead of having a simple majority to put it into effect immediately. So 
So it's a double-edged sword in terms of taking a vote. If you don't have a supermajority, I believe that there should be a supermajority. I believe this is, this is a, a state of Illinois problem and that um, everyone in that legislature needs to come together. They might not like what they see. They might not like 100%. They might not even like 60% of it. But it's something that needs to be done. And um, as long as it solves the problem in a fair way, then, um, then we need to do it. And, and we need to do it as you know, a unified body to say, and send a strong message too, economically, especially to the bond markets and, and businesses say, okay, wait, Illinois didn't just you know, pass major reform to its financial system. It overwhelmingly passed major reform to its financial system. Here we have a body that's willing to do what needs to be done in order to, to save the state's financial system. And therefore, I as a business want to come down and invest. Or I as a business don't want to leave the state now because I have a greater sense of security. So there's, I'm sorry, I kind of went off on a, did you have a second question? I do have a second question. It's about gun control or, yeah. or, or concealed carry. So it's my understanding that a trailer bill, which I think one has been introduced in the Senate already, could help add some of the additional protections the governor was looking for. Right. Will that pass in the House? It already didn't pass in the House. It um, the trailer bill the trailer bill was passed. Um, there was a trailer bill that was sent through um, the Senate, and it made um, changes to the concealed carry bill that passed. And to give you an idea, some of the some of the changes that were being discussed were um, not allowing guns in any establishment that serves alcohol at all. Right now, and that was part of the governor's veto. He said, "No, I don't want guns in any place that serves alcohol." Um, the law says as long as you're not making 51% of your revenue off of liquor, you can carry a gun into that establishment. So your family restaurant down the street, that maybe 10% you know, of their revenue comes from alcohol sales, you could carry a gun in there. And the governor said, no, I don't like that idea. Guns and alcohol don't mix. And so he vetoed that. Um, the legislature overrode that veto. Um, I chose, I voted to uphold that veto. I thought that was reasonable. And um, there were a lot of people I was hearing from on both sides of the issue who said, you know, Sam, I'm for concealed carry, but do we really need to have guns in bars? Sam, I'm against concealed carry, but I'm really against carrying guns into bars. So that was, that was an interesting area where people on both sides of the issue came to an agreement. So I was a little surprised that that was not upheld, that part. The other, another part of that, of the concealed carry bill, um, mandate or says that if I'm carrying a firearm on me, a concealed firearm, and I get pulled over um, by the police, I do not have to notify the law enforcement agent that I have a concealed firearm. Um, so the amendatory veto said, no, if, if Sam is carrying a concealed firearm and the police pull him over, he has to immediately tell the law enforcement agent that he is carrying a firearm. So that was another one of the amendatory vetoes that was overwritten. Um, these issues were, once that veto was overridden, the Senate passed a bill um, out of the Senate to the House that would have modified the law to include those changes. Um, and that's what that's what uh, Wendy's referring to. It did not, it failed in the House. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, under the federal law, under sure. the federal law of the entire law, instead of saying you can't go to a building with alcohol and stuff like that, yeah. it simply says you can't carry guns under the influence. Yeah. And that is and that is in the bill. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean if you're going for pizza because you sell beer and wine, you know, it's pick up your pizza and go. You know, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, it's legal for you to there, you don't pick up the pizza and go. Sure. And and I understand your I understand your point. I, I think that um, I think for a lot of folks, again on both sides of the issue, um, I, I think there is just a level of uncomfortableness. And and you're right, there is there is that in the bill that says if you're if you're under the influence, you, you can't carry, and if you carry, um, you know there's there's a punishment for it. Yes, Judy. Hi. Um, is there any provision in the bill that allows a police officer, or uh, when he is about to stop someone, when he is about to stop someone, to know whether or not the car he is approaching is driven by someone who is may have a concealed weapon? That, that's being discussed right now at the state police level in terms of setting up a database. So if um, I have, you know, you give me your license and I run Judy Armstrong through the system, it might get flagged. And this, there's, there's no immediate provision for this, but there's discussion about this to say she does have a concealed carry license. 
Thank you. Can I have a follow-up? Yep. Um, I, I would like the same kind of protection for firefighters as they approach a home, if they can run it and know when they're going into a house. Often paramedics face situations that are very difficult and it would be good if they knew going in whether or not the home they were entering had a license for concealed carry. That's, very, that's, that's a good suggestion. Thirdly, if there's a way to link it to medical marijuana, because while the weapon alone presents a danger to public safety officials, if there's a weapon and drugs involved, right. it can be even worse. There's, Thank um, you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's, that's a very good point, and I think um, you have the medical marijuana bill that is um, waiting for the governor's signature. So if he, if he signs that, I'm sure you're going to see a follow-up um, amendment to the concealed carry bill to address that. This, this, you bring up a very interesting topic because um, I, I wasn't, oh, just give me one I wasn't on. Um, this wasn't even on my radar until until somebody brought this up to me. Um, there's a there's a senator named by the name of Senator Daniel Biss, and um, and he recently became quite interested in the proliferation of drones for um, for law enforcement, for for traffic, for speed, uh, for issuing speeding tickets, and. Apparently, they're very inex uh, they're relatively inexpensive, all things considered, and um, so agencies are starting to use drones in various parts of the country to do to do their I don't want to say spy, but you know for surveillance. And so he um, he's been diligently putting um, legislation together that would restrict the usage of, of drones in in the state and and really limit um, as to what they could be used for, including requiring. Um, requiring court order um, to do so. But there is no currently, what I'm, we already have a database in place in Illinois. The ACLU has done phenomenal work on disclosing that. Um, there are different uh, townships and places in, the, in Illinois that are collecting that information via the license plate. And I don't know, what are, what's protecting us from that invasion? Um, I'm not trying to. I'm just wondering. <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I don't have. I don't have a direct answer for you. I can't say X, Y, and Z are protecting you from this. Um, I, I was having a conversation with somebody, somebody earlier, and it was basically, in this day and age, there is no privacy. Whether that's right or wrong, you know, I mean, that's up to the individual. But it's. Oh no no no! Whether whether you agree whether that's right or wrong is up to someone's personal opinion. Um, but in terms of in terms of the lack of privacy, yes, I I, I I don't know how to answer your question at this time. But um, let me um, yeah, let me let me let me talk to some people about it. that's a very good question. Now we do have um, Matt Ryan from uh, Comptroller Topeka's office. Would you mind coming up here, Matt? Can I see one? Thank you so much. Matt is going to um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the issues that are going on in the Comptroller's office and some of the, the programs that she provides and whatever else you'd like to talk about, Matt. <laughs> we could be here a while. Um, well, obviously, I am not Judy Barnes Pinka, and um, she is under the weather, so at around 4.15 this afternoon or 4 o'clock, they inform me that I would be addressing you all, which uh, I'm looking forward to. Don't ever try and drive from Chicago to here uh, around this time. It was a nightmare. I literally was sweating in the car with the air glass. I'm like, I'm never going to make this. And prior to coming here, our chief of staff kept thanking me for being willing to do this. And I thought to myself, well, she could have done this. I mean, I show up late, had nothing to say. Um, <laughs> no, I do have something to say. So the comptroller's office, uh, as you know, serves, the comptroller, I should say, Judy Bartspinka, is the uh, chief fiscal officer for the state. Uh, every check that is cut to a vendor, 
to a state employee, uh, lottery checks, those all go through us. And when education and non-for-profits are waiting for payments, they're calling our office and asking, where is our money? Unfortunately, we, we only get to write the checks. We have no control over the actual banking account or generating the money. So we are, you know, I should, I should say the comptroller is often faced with difficult decisions on who needs to be paid. You know, uh, typically we'll pay, it's a three to six month wait, and uh, I think we'll get to that here. But right now we're actually on time with a lot of our payments. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is happening, but don't get your hopes up. That's gonna be a, just a blip of good news. And then pretty quickly here, we'll, we'll go back to that three to six month delay. Um, <clears throat> to give you a first hand view of the state's uh, fiscal condition that the comptroller sees, um, she does things like this. And had she been feeling well, she goes around the state and she tries to give you an idea of what we're actually facing. You, you're often hearing some numbers in the news, in your newspaper, and they can vary by a billion or so dollars. The truth is, there's actually a large amount of bills that are out there that we can't account for. So when you hear that we're six billion dollars in debt, it could be closer to seven, seven and a half billion. And we'll talk a little bit why that happens, but sometimes there's some of the major agencies um, hold on to bills or invoices for a while before they give them to us. So we don't know who's holding on to what. We only know what's on our desk. All right. So right now, at any given time of the year, the state has a mountain of unpaid bills totaling anywhere from six billion to nine billion dollars. Right now we're closer to the $6 billion mark uh, because we had an influx of money during this recent tax season. And uh, you probably heard we, we were about $2 billion we received that we weren't planning on. Um, so while we're trying to pay, pay schools, businesses, hospitals, um, like I said, anywhere from a two to six month wait, at the same time our pension situation. So we've got all these bills mounting and we've got a pension situation that's growing um, worse every day. We're $97 billion in the red as we sit here today. Uh, and it's growing an estimated $5 million a day our pension system is growing. Because of those problems, the credit rating is taking a beating. It's, uh, it's like you or I, once our credit is dinged up, we have to pay a lot more interest to borrow money, which we've been doing a lot of. So now it's costing us more money just to keep up. And um, I think the last time I looked at the numbers, our general budget, our overall budget for the state, we spend almost 20, I think it's around 20% of our budget is eaten up by pension alone. That is an insane number that cannot be sustained. Um, you know, we've heard politicians get out there and talk about we are on the brink of bankruptcy or some pretty significant things. I'm not saying that's where we're at. If you've heard recently, Detroit just filed Chapter 9. These are real things. I mean, Detroit used to be the fourth largest city in the country, and they just filed bankruptcy. If we think these problems aren't real, they are. And that's why the council is doing all she can uh, to urge legislators to hold the line on increasing the budget and spending. We've got lots to take care of now. Um, when we get our arms around the pension deal, I think that's gonna make a big difference. I think Representative Yingling would agree. And I, I think we are moving in the right direction. So uh, some of you have been wondering how we still have these problems when the state passed a 67% tax increase a couple of years ago. The reality is, as that new income, as that new tax revenue came in, we spent more money. Our expenses got, grew along with that increase in revenue. So we virtually have stayed the same. It'll, it'll come. I can yell pretty good, I have kids. Uh, 
this is actually relaxing to talk in it with adults. But, so little progress actually has been made with our fiscal condition. I mean, we, we, the 67% increase, as we were told, was going to help pay that backlog of bills, which all the intention was to do that. Unfortunately, between Medicaid and pension costs and everything else, and the cost of living, that didn't happen. In addition to all that, we're seeing hardships just because of the environment, the fiscal environment as a nation for so long we were struggling. You see a lot of our non-for-profits and folks that depend and need money to keep their doors open, vital services that they do for the state, need that money. And um, so the problem is, you know, it's easy, we hear things, it's just if there's no easy fix. So it's going to be, we have to keep, you know, as the Comptroller always says, it's a slow grind. You just have to hold the line and we will get out of it. Some suggest we borrow more money to pay down the bills. We've heard that. Why don't we borrow more, pay all of our bills? I'm sure if I was a vendor, that would sound appealing to, uh, to, get, to get our money. But that would be essentially, that's like if, if you or I maxed out all of our credit cards, we'd go and get some new credit cards to pay off the old ones. Well, we're not, we're, we're making the situation work and we're digging in further by asking and taking on more debt. The goal is, in the Comptroller's opinion, yeah. is to, to try and really get a, our arms around the spending and to do what we can to slowly start nipping away at this, at this at the debt. When we get the pension under control, you're gonna see some of that start to happen. Um, Instead, that she believes in a responsible approach. As you can tell, I, I was given these. They, they would not let me come up here and just speak from the hip, so they gave me some notes, but I do know some of this. All right, uh, for instance, Comptroller Topinka, the state has moved to, so these are some talking points on what we're doing to help as an office. One thing that the, the Comptroller did was, when, when we came into office, we were still sending out a hard copy. It sounds small, but it's actually saved millions of dollars. We would send out a hard copy check to vendors for every itemized bill. I just met with, we started a council for non-profits. We met with them yesterday. One of the, a woman was saying that she used to get 400 checks, some of them for $4, $10, but she would get in a month 400 hard copy checks at 47 cents postage and everything else, it's actually saved a few million dollars. We now have over 90% of all of our vendors electronically being paid and um, saving, saving some money. So we're looking for efficiencies in how to do this. One of the other things she's talked about is combining the treasurer's office and the comptroller's office, which would save another few million dollars. Essentially, we, we can definitely function She plans to push some of those initiatives in Springfield. She's been doing that. She's been going around the state. She's going to continue to do that. So wherever we can save money for the state in our little world, we're doing that. The other thing she's done when we came into the office, payments were almost eight months behind. We're now running about three or four months. And the quicker that we can pay these bills, the less we're paying in interest. Um, there is a, a prompt payment act which spurs a lot of these agencies why they hang on to invoices for so long. So child services might hold on to 25% of the bills and give it to us at the end, you know, three months late. Because they, as soon as they hand that bill to us, they've got 30 days to pay it. Otherwise, interest uh, starts accruing. So we're doing some things there and looking at ideas and ways to make sure you can get bills paid efficiently. So um, that's about it for the talking points. So in uh, summary, we have the pension crisis, we have debts, there are ways if you ever need anything or you know of a non-for-profit or anyone that's waiting on a bill, you can go to our website, you can check to see the status on those payments. The other thing we've started in the office is that transparency, uh, is, you know, the Comptroller is always talking about true transparency in government. You can now go on our website and you can look up any state employees what they make, you can look up what I make, you can look up any state contract to any vendor, what they're being paid. So, you know, 
it's time that we start tracking. It's, a, it's, it's really difficult as a comptroller to manage your funds when we don't even know what's out there. We have people hiding bills, handing in invoices late, and one of the things we're going to do is help clean that up. So we know exactly where we're at. And when, you know, when it comes time to manage our bills, we know Child Services has this, and they're not spending over what they're appropriated. And, um, you know, in order to get, you know, it would be like you and I trying to take care of our, our home bills and my wife hiding some of them, which I, I, I know she has done at times. <laughs> and I find them in the car, tucked under something, I'm like, what? That's weird that the Coles bill is under the seat. Uh, <laughs> no, that's true, though. And she'll be very upset to tell you that. But that's about it. Uh, if there were any questions, I can certainly try and answer it. Does uh, anyone have any any questions that Tony? Um, the former DCFS director allegedly defrauded the government eighteen million dollars. Where are we with that? There's been nothing in the news. Are the kids going to be held accountable for that? Who, who was that? The eighteen million. Oh, um, I, I don't have any intimate knowledge on, on where they're at with that, but um, I'm not even sure who's, who's investigating it, if it was the Attorney General's office or if that's um, a U.S. prosecutor's probe, but I can certainly look into it and see if, if we have any answers. We'll look into that and we'll let you know. Yes? I'm always concerned about late payment of bills for our schools especially, mm -hmm. but in our community, we are beginning a major project at 83 in Rollins that should go over a three-year period to, to improve the intersection. It is a three-year project jointly between the state and the county, and when I asked if we should even turn the first shovel, do we have the money to finish this, everybody's, oh yes, of course. But if that intersection is torn up and delayed because we don't have the money to pay the, the workers, if it would go to five years, six years, the economic impact yeah, on our sense. area would be devastating. Yeah. So I'm very concerned about that. And I'm just wondering if either of you has any insight that could allay my fears. Yeah. So out of, often you'll see a lot of it coming out of capital bonds. The, I don't know what the mix is for that. So, you know, there's a couple of initiatives that are going on. And so depending on what initiative, that, if it's the state initiative um, that Governor Quinn has touted, you know, but we can certainly look into that. We can see, we can find out even on our website where the college, who's been awarded the contract and where the funding is coming from. The, my understanding, Judy, is the majority of that project is actually being financed by the county. So um, the county is picking up part of the state's portion, as it's been explained to me. Unless something's changed, that's my understanding of the arrangement. Um, in terms of, and like Matt said, in terms of those capital projects and roads, is that many times that money is, is um, funded through the capital bonds. So that money's there and set aside, and the project doesn't proceed from an IDOT perspective until that money is there for the project. So you don't run into a situation like what you said, where all of a sudden everyone drops their shovels and the project is delayed. That, that actually, that answer actually parallels what I've been told. Don't worry, the money's there. However, when I keep hearing how dire the situation is, it scares me to think that there's little piles of money places. <laughs> it does, the pieces don't fit for me. Right. There's, um, I think to answer your question, you've got to keep in mind that our long-term liabilities with pensions is in large part what's driving our, our financial problem. But there are also so many parts of the budget, albeit they've been reduced, that, that still are, are being used to fund various things within the state, whether that be road projects, education, public safety. Um, it's not to the levels they should be because it's being shoved out by our other financial obligations, but there still is money there to keep the state operating at a very Typically, when we see the spending and the payments, you know, very rarely will they, you know, roads and that, those type of job producing um, projects are rarely left unfunded because it is a major 
drive for the economy. So as the representative said, we do see when we're looking from our office and we see some of the appropriations shrink and everything else, there's still lots of money being spent on roads and they're very good at capturing their, their dollars um, to be used. So hopefully we haven't gotten to the point where we're starting road projects that we're not going to finish. I haven't, I, I think you're going to be safe. Yeah, I think so too. Let's hope so. If not, you know where to go. We can. Um, I know we have, we, because of the band performance here, we're going to have to vacate in about five minutes. So, David, do you have a question? Or, um, for Matt, I mean, yep. just, just a, do you know how many states in, in the U.S. have a comptroller, treasurer? Oh, condemnation? Yeah. I don't. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't. I don't know. You know, the in many states, the comptroller's office, you know, in our state, it's argued which one, the treasurer, the comptroller, is where they are in position, who's higher. You know, a lot of states like Texas, the comptroller, I mean, it's actually Illinois, the comptroller is above the treasurer's office if you look from, you know, an organizational chart. So, but I don't know, I, I believe the last time someone asked me that, it was like in the 30s or something. But I do, I, I can find out for you. That would be something I should have on hand. Uh, the question I had, I was wanting to ask earlier. Yeah. Um, so, you know, coming from a younger person, uh, there's a lot of different issues that, you know, I feel are in big need of attention. And recently on the news, I was watching a uh, um, uh, recently on the news, there was a, a story that was talking about young, uh, young people's unemployment rates. And I don't exactly remember the numbers by heart, but it was really high. And um, I have actually two questions when it comes to specifically this topic. Um, is there anything in Congress right now, in state Congress right now, that is, you know, in any way that could help, you know, younger people um, unemployment actually go down? Um, because it's a very alarming thing uh, because a lot of people, especially who graduated from high school, who want to start, you know, paying for college, which I'll, you know, ask a question about that in a little bit too, but is there anything going on in Congress right now that has anything to do with, you know, helping the unemployment of the younger generation? Um, tune in on this. Um, and I, I'm not too sure if there's anything at the, um, at the federal level. I do know that much of the discussion is based around, um, like what you said, college funding and the huge amount of debt that um, young people have to take on for college. And when you look at the amount of debt that people are graduating with after going to college for four and even now sometimes five years, is that you can be easily in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, you already have, so you already have this massive debt burden as you graduate to maybe start off, you know, depending on what field you're going in, maybe 40 or $50,000 job, uh, 40, $50,000 a year job. So this creates, um, it, this creates an already problematic situation for, for the younger generation because they're being saddled with debt um, just so they can get a job. Um, the other problem too that I think that we're facing in the country, and this is more of a, a federal issue as opposed to necessarily state or more localized on the state, is that um, with the globalization of the world's economy, is that you have seen an enormous amount of um, companies shipping their, uh, their manufacturing facilities overseas. And this is something. manufacturing overseas and this is a huge problem because it's only going to get exacerbated so whereas in the past where maybe you would have New York competing against Detroit or New York competing against Chicago now you've got New York competing against Beijing New York competing against London and so with the globalization also means that you're going to have um, you know you're gonna have jobs move about the world and and I am actually what I would project and I, I can't give you a timeline is when I would see this happening, is where we as a, a society, we as a people become more globalized. Whereas I'm gonna move to New York for a job, I'm gonna move to Sydney for a job. And and I think that's, and I think that's something that um, more I, I, I would say your generation is probably gonna start to see where you actually are doing more traveling for your, for your, for your job globally 
as opposed to just regionally or even on a nationwide level. Um, the, I, right now, the, the statistics, especially for the, um, for the younger generation in terms of job placement, are not that good. And I was actually reading housing numbers that are showing that young people are actually losing a percentage of home ownership. So there's actually a smaller percent of young people who are, who are going into to home ownership. And, um, and home ownership is really uh, the backbone of a local economy and also the backbone of a greater economy. So I don't have a direct answer for your question in terms of if Congress is doing anything for that. Um, what we need to do um, at the state level is to attract more businesses, in my opinion, bring more corporate development into our state. So we do have an opportunity for people who are going to college in our state to then continue to live in our state and work in our state. Um, or in, and you're, you're joining the Army, right? So when you come back is to be able to, to work in the state, to be able to live in the state that, that, that you grew up in. And, um, and that's what's really important because we're losing that right now. We're seeing an exodus of people out of Illinois because the jobs have left Illinois. And, um, and people are coming in, many times getting educated, then leaving. They, there's nothing to stay for. And or at least that's the perception. So we have to change that perception to make sure that we bring in jobs and then be able to retain um, the educated workforce in, in the state. All right. Um, I know we gotta we gotta stop now because the band's going on. Um, I'm more than happy to stay if anyone else has any other questions, and I'm sure Matt or you will be able to stay if anyone has any questions. All right. So, um, uh, Comptroller Topinka has said that um, she is more than happy to reschedule an event. So, if if you were here specifically to to meet her, if you'd just like to sign in, um, we can make sure that you get an email when the next event is rescheduled. So um, thank you so much for coming, you guys. Uh, again, my top priority is to be accessible to the residents of the district. And um, all my contact information, uh, be sure to grab it on your way out. Feel free to give me a call or email me anything that's on your mind. Thanks so much, you guys.